On today's episode of Locked On Canucks, it was a crazy weekend in the NHL playoffs. And now, crazy rumors are starting to fly in Canucks land. Of course, it's another day, another episode of our greatest Canucks series. And if the Canucks do make the playoffs again, is it time Vancouver starts having live viewing parties once again? It's Locked On Canucks on a Monday, May the 16th, and it starts now. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Locked On Canucks. I'm, of course, your host, Justin Hooney. I want to welcome you to today, Monday, May the 16th episode. Hope you guys all had a wonderful Weekend today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Yes, it is Monday, a new episode. As I just mentioned, a very wild weekend in the world of sports. Not only were there game sevens galore in the NHL, also in the NBA, but now rumors are starting to percolate across Canucks land. There's analytics talk again. And it's, you know, things are moving and shaking now and the off-season game has begun. So we're going to get into that. But first, um, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank you for all the support we have received. We have more and more content. This is just the beginning. And of course, please follow me on Twitter at underscore process sports. And I want to thank you for making Locked on Canucks your first listen of the day. We are free. And available, of course, wherever you get your podcast service. So, guys, crazy weekend, as I mentioned, in the world of hockey. My favorite moment was, of course, seeing uh, my beloved Toronto Maple Leafs once again uh, lose at home. Once again in Game 7. And once again, don't make it out of the first round. I had took great joy in that. That was the cherry on top of my weekend. Um, I actually had the luxury of one of my other gigs uh, covering the game from Maple Leaf Square. I was in the media pit um, at Maple Leaf Square with other reporters and stuff like that. And uh, just to see the faces um, of those Leaf fans just so demoralized and crushed and hurt. Um, it was a wonderful scene to behold. And then seeing online, seeing those absolute uh, delusional fans fighting one another. Um, just Proved to show you how much, you know, Canada. But the one good thing is, afterwards, all of Canada was united in seeing the Leafs lose. And that, to me, was an amazing feat in itself. Um, of course, Edmonton, we get a Edmonton won in Game 7 against LA. Connor McDavid proved why he is the best player in the world. Jake Ottinger uh, stood on his head, but the Flames got lucky and got one more goal. And now that we have a battle of Alberta, we have a battle of Florida. Uh, there is no NHL or NBA tonight, which is kind of you know interesting. But because of that, there was a lot of rumors out there today in Canucks land uh, under this weekend, really talking about you know Jim Rutherford did an interview with Jason Greger and Frank Saravelli talking about what the Canucks need: more sandpaper, more cap relief, and they want to get younger. So it became very evident to me, and it's if you it hasn't become evident to you yet that. Jim Rutherford wants to completely rebuild this organization with his image. They let go of longtime trainers and strength and conditioning coaches today. Um, and you're getting the sense now that Alvin and Rutherford really want to strip everything down in certain, mo in certain aspects and put their stamp on this franchise that they are the ones in charge. And quite frankly, um, that is needed. You know, um, I've said it before, this franchise, this team um, needs a renovation. The renovating Rogers Arena this, uh, this offseason, as I said last week, they're going to build a new practice ring. And quite frankly, why not renovate the entire franchise from top to bottom? Get things, <laughs> get things, excuse me, get things on a point where, you know, you have your stamp on it. You know, when you buy a house, and I might have mentioned this before, when you buy a house and it's a bit of a fixer upper and you got to strip things down and you want to renovate it, but you see the potential, you see the character of it. You see that the way, Hey, if I change this here, this year, this year, I can see it working. 
That is what Jim Rutherford is doing. That is what he's doing. He wants to add sandpaper because, as we know in the Western Conference, you need to play a bit of a heavy game um, to play in the playoffs. You look at the past cup winners. You know, Tampa Bay has heavy players like Maroon and Sorelli and, you know, even guys like St- Hedman. I, the one thing I will say about this, watching that Tampa Bay and Toronto series just showed me just how amazingly brilliant Victor Hedman is as, is as a defenseman and as a player. Absolutely brilliant. The way he can just take the puck up the ice, the way he can defend, unbelievable. If the Canucks had a guy like Victor Hedman, it would solve a lot of problems on the back end, a ton of problems. But alas, there's only one Victor Hedman out there. Um, however, going back to that renovation, look, the Canucks have a lot of work to do. And they want to, Jim Rutherford made it evidently clear, we want to have a heavier team, a younger team, and we want to shed cap space. Well, when you look at the cap, it's going to go up, projected to go up a million dollars for the first time in a couple of years. It's going to go up a million bucks for a Canucks team that, you know, is very cap strapped. That million bucks can mean a lot. So as it projects right now, the Canucks should have about 15 million to, and they have about 17 players signed. So you have some room to do something. But the question is, what are they going to do? So, you know, a lot of you know interviews and reports on Canucks podcasts and Canucks radio um, indicating that JT Miller uh, might be the guy on the move. Um, I'm not a big believer in that, to be honest with you. I think, as I mentioned before, this is all just a game, a marketing ploy game by Miller's agents, the Canucks. It's that whole game of, oh, well, he's not going to take a hometown discount as Frank Cervelli reported. Um, he's He gets the sense, excuse me, that he's going to take a market deal. Um, but what is a market deal for JT Miller? We don't know yet. So the way I see it shaking out, it's all, we're at that stage right now before the draft. Um, you know, the playoffs are still going on. We're getting all these rumors popping up everywhere. Well, oh, well, you know, Miller's name is popping up with trade rumors. But if they, you know, OEL, Garland, Myers, all these trade things are coming up. Other reports are indicating that Besser's working on a bridge deal for Brock Besser that potentially could be traded to help save cap space. So it's all, it's that time of year where all these rumors are popping out and it's all rumors, rumors, rumors. I want to warn everybody, take a deep breath, calm down, because this is all just a negotiating ploy. It's all negotiation tactics, information is being leaked from everywhere because whether it's the team or the player, they want to get the upper hand going into these negotiations for the Canucks, which is going to be a very big offseason for negotiations because, as we know, Brock Besser has a qualifying offer as an RFA for $7.5 million, which, as we all know, won't cut it with the Canucks, current, the current Canucks cap structure. Then we, of course, JT Miller and Bo Horvat, both JT Miller, 29 years old, Bo Horvat, 27, are eligible for extensions come July Horvat, of course, the captain, 31 goals, definitely due for a raise. JT Miller, the last couple of years, has been playing on a bargain deal. 99 points was the Canucks' best player this year besides Thatcher Demko. He's going to want to raise. So it's all of this negotiating tactics, all this this game. It's a game. It's a war. And it's it's a game of chicken, really. See, who bites first? I don't see them trading JT Miller. I don't. I think... We know what the motive of this team is. They want to make the playoffs. They want, they're not going to strip down and rebuild this whole roster because you have guys, Demko, Hughes, Pedersen in their prime. You're going to keep Bo Horvat, who's still in his prime. You're not going to blow it up, right? It, it wouldn't make any sense to blow it up unless you're going to trade every, right? They're going to try to push for the playoffs next year. So they're going to make hockey moves. And try to shed cap. So they're going to try to kill two birds in one stone. Which for Canucks fans as we all know. Has kind of been the whole motto of this team for the last 10 years. But. All these rumors. Just take it easy. It's all a game. It's all a ploy. And any negotiate. And I'm sure many of you listening out there. If you're in a job and you're negotiating. Um, you know with your employer or whatever. You always you know. Whether you aim high. But you're not expecting to get that. Say if you get a job and you're asking for. $75,000 a year, but you know you're going to get their offer. You know you're going to get 65. But if you ask for 75, they might say, Hey, well, we'll give you 60. We say, Hey, how about 65? We'll meet in the midway point, right? 
That's all it is. It's all just a game of negotiating. Leaks are coming in and out because they want to see who bites first. Just like the Canucks just did with Bruce Brujo playing a game of chicken to see who bites first. And quite frankly, Bruce Brujo bit first. Now, the other thing I want to talk about about the Canucks and all these rumors, not about player personnel per se. That was a bit of a tongue twister there, but analytics. So we know Alvin and Rutherford like analytics and they want to use analytics when constructing this roster. Now, analytics have exploded over the last decade thanks to the whole money ball thing from baseball, the great movie by Brad Pitt about Billy Bean. I'm sure you all have seen it and you all know all about it. So look, when it comes to analytics, I'm I I believe in analytics, but I don't believe they tell the full story, right? Uh, you need to me, the eye test is still the greatest indicator to me. The way I see analytics, the way I treat analytics, is kind of like a side dish when you go out for dinner. So you say you go to a steakhouse, you know the you, the eye test to me is the steak. That is the main thing that I look at. That is the most important thing. But the analytics, like the mashed potatoes, the twice baked potatoes, the sautéed veggies, whatever, it makes it more enticing. Or it could make it more de-enticing. But that should not be your die hard. You know, analytics should not be the crux of it. You don't go to a restaurant and you don't order your ma- your meal based off the side dishes. You order it because of the main, which to me, again, is the eye test. So Alvin said they use analytics, but they're not the they're not the indicator for the final decision, which is correct. So I just felt that you know, analytics are important. They're a great indicator to give you more information. And especially in the, the day and age, or I'm a firm believer of, you can never have enough information. If whenever you're going into a situation in life, whether that's, you know, like, like I mentioned, business, relationships, jobs, whatever, you can never make a decision without having enough information. And that's why analytics helps. So when you're looking at a potential free agent or you're looking to re-sign a guy like JT Miller or Brock Besser or Bo Horvat or whoever, you have the eye test, so you see how they play on a daily basis. You see their practice skills. You see how they are in the locker room. That is what you see on a day-to-day basis. That is the main, should be the main focus of your negotiating ploy. But you look at the analytics and you can say, hey, well, your advanced analytics here don't match up to what the comp you're trying to achieve, attain for a certain contract status, right? So that is the way the Canucks can use analytics as a way to supplement their eye tests, their supplement, their vision for their roster and how this player fits in, but it shouldn't be the be all end all. And um, I know in, in the, to divulge a little bit, but I know in basketball terms, uh, sorry, basketball realms, people, you know, are big believers in analytics. But if you look at it, you know, sometimes analytics don't tell the whole story with basketball players. For example, the mid range shot, the mid range shot in basketball, um, was considered a dead shot because of the three pointer. But when you look at it in the playoffs, guys are hitting the mid range. Luka Doncic just wax the Phoenix Suns mid range. He can get to his mid range plot. Chris Paul, Devin Booker, bad series. I'm sorry, bad game sevens, but they are mid range players. Giannis could hit the mid range. He's, you know, he's all, Jason Tatum could hit the mid range. Of course, Steph Curry can hit the three, but he can also get in the mid range too. So you look at, and again, going back to the Canucks. The eye test and seeing how the players fit together, mesh together on the ice should be the first decision, the first, the main way to determine whether you want a player to resign with you. But the analytics should support it. As I mentioned before, they are the side dishes to or the seasoning to your main. So that's kind of my thoughts on analytics. Um, As I touched on earlier, all these rumors about JT Miller trades and, you know, Ekman Larson trades. First of all, nobody's going to take Ekman Larson's contract. Um, Myers' contract you're stuck with. It is all just a market, not a market. Let me think about business. It's all just negotiation tactics by the team and agents to try to get either side to bite first to get some leverage going into the, in the negotiations. All about leverage and negotiation. That's where all these rumors are coming from. I my prediction today on May the 16th, I see JT Miller staying, Brock Besser staying. Maybe, sorry, excuse me, maybe Brock Besser staying. It depends on if Kuzmenko signs, but I definitely see Bo Horvat and JT Miller staying. 
maybe some trades with Garland or OEL potentially if you find a sucker for him. But like they say, a sucker is born every minute, but I just don't see one of those suckers in the NHL right now. So that's kind of the, you know, the uh, umbrella of the Canucks rumors for today. Um, Coming up after this break, though, we're going to dive into our greatest Canucks series where we talk about another one of my favorite Canucks of all time. Number 14, the guy who proved the doubters wrong, had an unbelievable story, and eventually became the Dragon Slayer. Yes, if you don't know who we're talking about, we are talking about one, Alex Burroughs. So stay tuned. We're going to take a dive into Alex Burroughs' career with the Vancouver Canucks. But first, I want to talk to you guys about Bet Online. Bet Online continues to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL future bets. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to today's head to the website today, excuse me, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online where the game starts. So we're going to start talking about Alex Burroughs' career. And Alex Burroughs, as we all know, had one of the greatest stories um, in NHL history, in my opinion, working his way up from a being a ball hockey legend to working his way from the ECHL to the AHL, to the Canucks, to the fourth line, the third line, and then becoming an integral part in the franchise's greatest era, in my opinion. Alex Burroughs, to me, um, grew up in that Manitoba Moose era where there was guys like Bieksa, Raymond, Hansen, Kessler. Those guys all grew up through the system together and came up around the same time. And it wasn't easy for Alex Burroughs. It wasn't. You know, he first he came in as just a penalty killer. Um, he came in um, as just a checker, and him and then him and Ryan Kessler formed into one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest, uh, one of the two of the biggest pests uh, in the league. Um, and you know, they were notoriously getting under people's skins. If you guys haven't seen it yet, look at the '09 playoffs uh, when they were chirping with uh, St. Louis. Um, I'm not going to repeat what they said. Uh, but as a young child, uh, I watched that video quite frequently because I thought it was absolutely hilarious. Um, they, Alex Burroughs, to me, was the definition of hard work and determination will get you where you want to go. He wasn't the most skilled. He wasn't the fastest. He not the greatest shot. But what he did was he was smart. He was able to utilize his skills and his assets and his work ethic to get where he had to go. Alex Burroughs when he first came in the league, was a purely just a checker, just a, a you know defensive guy, a pest. But he developed into what? A top-line player on a team that was a President's Trophy winning team. You know, he was eventually a 30-goal scorer, a multiple-time 20-goal scorer. He was and still is one of the great. He was one of the most clutch players, too. Whenever the moment was too, whenever the moments got bigger, Alex Bro showed up. Of course, we all know Game Seven versus Chicago. The whole, you know, the whole weight of the world was on the Canucks franchise. The Presidents Trophy winners up three nothing, lose three straight to the defending champion Chicago Box, the team that knocked over the two previous years. And of course, he scores the first goal, misses the pen, misses the breakaway or uh, the penalty shot, and then finally ends it uh, in overtime. And you know, Alex Burroughs, you know, for me, the my that that's my greatest Alex Burroughs one, the Dragon Slayer one. Of course, game two of the Stanley Cup finals. But then of course the first the first big moment I think Alex Burroughs ever had was um at the twenty the two thousand nine season. The Canucks had lost ten straight. Uh they were down against Carolina. Um, and they were, you know, they're in the midst of a 10 game losing. There's a lot of pressure on the team. And Burroughs gets on a breakaway, scores against Camber with his patented backhand, forehand, backhand, deep shelf job, takes his stick, bangs across his knee, busts the streak. Um, and the Canucks kind of get on that way. And that was kind of the, 
ignition to me to that era where that three to four year span, that team was dominant, dominant, one of the, probably the best team in the National Hockey League uh, during those years. And that's the time where he ascended himself to a first line player. You know, that 08 09 season, he scored 28 goals. Then he scored 35 in 09 10. Then he scored 26 in 2011. And then he scored 28 in 2012. That's when he was playing on a line with Henrik Danielson. That's when Henrik and Daniel Sedin were at the peak of their powers. But what made, but before Henrik and Daniel Sedin, uh, before, excuse me, before Alex Burroughs, Henrik and Daniel Sedin would go through line mates on a daily, a yearly basis. Trent Klan, Anson Carter had a pop off here, Taylor Pyatt, all these guys. But why did Alex Burroughs stick for so long? Because he got to the right spots, he was smart on the boards, and he knew had a knack to get where the puck was going to go. And they built that chemistry. Alex Burroughs, all he knew how to do is he had to go go to the front of the net, put my stick on the ice. I know I'm going to get a pass somewhere, and the it's going to be a wide open net and put it in. But he was now people think that's easy. I anybody do it. It's not. You have to have the instincts. You have to have the intelligence to know and have the anticipation ability where the puck's going to be. And it takes repetition to know. Hey, Hank and Dan, you're going to be behind the boards. They're going to be behind the net. Or, and they're going to cycle. They're the cycle game is brilliant. So if I find this open seam up front, I'm going to get a wide open chance in the slot to score. And that is what he did so brilliantly. That is what made Alex Burrow so brilliant was his mind for the game. Of course, he was also a super pass that would get under people's skin. And a lot of people didn't like him. And he got in trouble with the rest. There was the whole Stefan OJ incident, the biting incident, all that stuff. But look, that I'm not here to talk about that because that's what made him so good. He played, walked that fine line. Him and Ryan Kessler... And Kevin Bieksa walked that line and towed it. But that's what made them so effective because they would get people off their game. And then that would create them to get extra extra space. And that is why in 2011, what made them so great, they were still pests, but they didn't retaliate as much. And that put the Canucks on the power play. And they had the best power play that year. And of course, they took advantage of that. So the way I, the way I look at Alex Burroughs' career was hard work, determination to get where he got, smarts to keep him where he was, and clutch factor. This, like I said, that goal against Carolina after a 10-game losing streak ignited that franchise, ignited that team and that core to go to the heights that the franchise has been, hadn't been to in a very long time in the playoffs and also regular season success that the team has never had before and never has seen since. That is what started it. Then there was the first sweep in franchise history against St. Louis where he shot the bow and arrow. Then, of course, the... Dragon Slayer goal. Then game two goal in the Stanley Cup Finals where we all thought we were going to win the Stanley Cup that year and it didn't happen. But regardless of the fact, Alex Burrows, one of the greatest Canucks of all time, a definite Ring of Honor member, a definite... Oh, he already is in the Ring of Honor, excuse me. Um, and just a guy that was so... You know, he won the Unsung Year Award, won the Most Exciting Player of the Year Award. Um Ball Hockey Hall of Famer, as I mentioned before, just a guy who will always be remembered to be as one of the greatest Canucks who ever lived. One of the greatest Canucks, um, just one of the greatest stories, excuse me, in NHL history. And Alex Burroughs, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart, all the memories you gave me as a child growing up as a Canucks fan, whether it was 2009 against Carolina, 20, uh, 2009 against St. Louis, 2011 against Chicago, 2011 against Boston the countless regular season hat tricks, everything, the trash talking, everything. Alex Burroughs is definitely one of the greatest Canucks and one of the greatest stories of work ethic and hard work in not only hockey history, in my opinion, but any sports history. To work your way from the bottom of the bottom to being a first-line player making millions of dollars on the best team in the NHL. So Alex Burroughs most definitely, in my opinion, is one of the greatest Canucks who ever lived. And coming up after this break, we're going to talk about the playoffs. Um, and potentially, is it time for the Canucks to be the playoffs? We reopen the whole outdoor viewing party conundrum in Vancouver. Because I know everybody is kind of hesitant about it. But first, I want to thank you for making Locked On NHL, sorry, Locked On Canucks, your first listen of the day. For your next listen of the day, listen to the Locked On Now podcast, nightly recaps of every NHL game with analysis from our local experts. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast services. And also, being that it is the NHL playoffs, summer is now right around the corner. Imagine 
dipping your finger into a plastic tub of birthday cake frosting and then opening your eyes and realizing it was only 150 calories and 16 grams of protein. That is what it's like to eat a birthday cake puff from Built. I just received my birthday cake puffs and I have never had anything like this before. They're available right now and we can't promise that they will be there tomorrow. So get them today at Built.com. And if you haven't tried the puffs, I'll let you in on a little secret because that's what friends do and we are all friends now. A chocolate-covered marshmallow protein bar. Yes, you heard me correct. A deliciously flavored marshmallow covered in 100% real chocolate. Make every day your birthday with Built Birthday Cake Puffs. Built has taken delicious experience of biting to a fresh slice of birthday cake and rolled it in 100% white chocolate and sprinkles with 150 calories, 16 grams of protein, 9 grams of sugar. This limited time flavor is now an amazing option. If you are looking for a healthy way to get flavor and variety in your day, all Built's are covered in 100% real chocolate, as I meant, which you can eat healthy and enjoy. Go to Built.com and get birthday cake puffs now. I have a special offer for all of you. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and get 15% off your order. Once again, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, guys. Last segment, and probably the most polarizing segment maybe of the show. Maybe it's a very hot-button topic, I find. Um, in the city of Vancouver and in the province of British Columbia and amongst Canucks fans because as we are watching the playoffs, especially amongst Canadian markets, we see Maple Leaf Square. We see the red lot they're calling in Calgary. We see the Oilers have their own viewing celebration. So that wonders, the question arises, is it time if the Canucks make the playoffs once again to have these public viewing gatherings put on by the team? Now, of course, the last time they had these public gatherings there was a notorious riot which people still remind me on a daily basis being that i am from vancouver and somehow they find it necessary to remind me oh your city you guys burned the city down you guys lost the Stanley cup finals first of all those people that were at those riots were not canucks fans they were just people that were there to cause anarchy they were anarchists okay they were not true canucks fans they were not true people and yes it was a black stain on the image of the city the most beautiful city in the world the city that most people don't understand is a world-class city, the most beautiful city in the world. You guys all know how much I love my hometown. I love it. Even though you could take me out of it. I can be anywhere in the world, but you can never take Vancouver out of me. But going back to the question I had, is it time? Yes, it is time. Not only because it creates marketing opportunities, it creates more sponsorships, it creates more buzz. You know what it else does? creates community and fan morale and it boosts it. I was at Maple Leaf Square covering the Leafs Tampa series live every game. It was packed. It was electric. Those fans were fully invested. But here's the thing. This is where the Canucks have to do it smart. And you see it um, through Calgary, Edmonton, all that. It has to be team controlled. has to be security. And it has to be regulated. So what does that mean? For example, Maple Leaf Square, when you enter in, you have to go through security. If you have a bag, they ask you to open up your bag and check your bag. The problem with the Vancouver in 2011 was it wasn't regular. It was just put on by the city and anybody could come and bring whatever they want. And that is how you start problems. When you have a, like a plaza or a outdoor viewing party put on by the team, that creates not only, like, for example, at the Daily Square, they're selling their own drinks and alcohol there. That's more money in MLSC's pocket. They're selling merch there, more money in MLSC's pocket. They're selling concession food there, more money in MLSC's pocket. Francesco Aquilini, I know you love your money. I know you want to make money. If the Canucks get in the playoffs, you create your own plaza. You put a big screen outside the parking lot across the street from Gate 16. You put a you put a big sc- uh, screen there. You close it off. You fence it off. You have security there. You let a limited amount of people because that's what they did at MLSC. Uh, sorry, Maple Leaf Square. You have a limited amount of people that are allowed it because it creates demand. And then you have concessions in there. You have jersey sales in there. And you keep it confined. You have security. And you make sure that you do your due diligence before you decide. There's never going to be another 100,000 people outside watching a game in Vancouver because A, the city doesn't trust people anymore because there's been two riots. B, there's no money in it 
because nobody's buying anything and they're just getting together and getting drunk off their own liquor. They're not spending any money at restaurants or anything like that. So if you're going to do it, you do it smart. You A, it's team controlled and operated. It's secure, whether that's a capacity limit and you have to have security to get you in and out. You can't take liquor in and out. You have to buy liquor in there and then you have to get out right away. That is the way it will work. It wasn't smart in 2011. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it smart. You're going to do it the right way. And I think when the Canucks make the playoffs next year, because they are going to, I'm saying that right now, they're going to make the playoffs. There will be an outdoor viewing party in Vancouver. And hopefully I will be there covering it or just as a fan live with my people getting hyped for a game one against whoever with the white towels waving. Or maybe they changed the white towel or something else. I don't know. But if I want to see it because fans deserve it, the whole COVID. One of my favorite memories as a Canucks fan, Scott Road. Just the joyous momentum. There. Now, that's not regulated or anything like that. It's just Canucks fans in Surrey as we are getting hyped. But Scott Road was electric. It was just a, a melting pot for Canucks fans to come together and just celebrate. And that is what is missing in this city. Just people celebrating joyous moments of Canucks fandom. And once that happens again, it will just boost the morale of fans. It will boost the morale of the city. It will make the city more attractive. It will just create more of a buzz. You know how many times Sportsnet shows, the whether it's Calgary, Edmonton, or Maple Leaf Square, all those viewing parts, that needs to happen here in Vancouver. And that will happen because why? They learn, hopefully they learn from their mistakes and understand, hey, if we want to do this, we got to do it the right way, do it smart, and learn from other franchises. And once that takes place, It'll be a money-making machine for Francesco Acquini. Fans will want to go. I will want to go. I will want to spend money on concession, food, drinks, beverage. Where I'll go with a whole bunch of, I'll go with a ten-man squad deep because you know that's how I roll with my friends. We will be there. We will be there live. We will be there lit. Game one of the playoffs next year. You can guarantee it. But first, they have a lot of work to do this offseason, and of course, they got to play the regular season. So before I get too excited, remember there's a lot of work to be done, but it is going to happen. I will manifest it. I will manifest that destiny. So. That is today's episode of Locked on Canucks. I want to thank you guys for making Locked on Canucks your first listen of the day. Of course, tomorrow is another day, another edition of our Greatest Canucks series. And, of course, there's going to be more rumors, and we'll have some more fun tomorrow. So I want to thank you guys again uh, for your second listen of the day. Take a listen to the Locked on NHL podcast from first-round matchups to each Stanley Cup kiss. Locked on NHL covers the playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from local experts every Monday through Friday. It is, of course, free and available wherever you get your podcasting services. Guys, take care, stay safe, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow.